Okay, so this is a brief review of chapter five. All right, so just like every other chapter, we have to start with definitions. So what is CSA? CSA is a multifaceted type of abuse that's very difficult to define. So obviously we talk about how defining is very important because without clear definitions, it's very hard to litigate based on these things, right? So there's different components um, of, def of the definitions of child sexual abuse, but they tend to differ in their focus and utility. So first there's non-contact CSA. So the first component is determining whether the abusive behavior included physical contact. So typically we think of CSA as fondling or sexual intercourse, but non-contact circumstances can also be considered CSA such as photographing a child and selling the pictures, right? There doesn't have to be contact necessarily for something to be defined as CSA. Um, the, other, the, the next component that they think about is the intention of the perpetrator. So then they look at whether the activity in question was sexually stimulating for the abuser. So for example, you know, it's somewhat normative for children to be nude around their family members, right? such as a parents, um, you know, if they're going to get in a bathtub or, you know, um, get dressed in the morning. So there's certain displays of affection or certain times where um, families will come in contact with each other without clothing that is pretty normative, right, within most family structures. So there has to be some kind of understanding of where those lines of normality blur in these situations of CSA. So you know, one measure of determining whether the action was interpreted sexually by the perpetrator is a way to determine whether or not CSA took place, right? And then the third component that they look at is the exertion of power or control over the child victim. So it's, it's really looking at whether an adult is using their authority or power to achieve sexual ends. So implicit in this is the idea that children can never give consent for sexual actions, right? For two reasons. One, they don't understand what they're consenting to, meaning they are below the legal age of consent. They cannot actually consent to sexual activity, right? No matter what the abuser tells them or says to them, they are not consenting, right? And two, you know, they're not in a position to refuse as a power dynamic difference between, you know, adults and children, or often we'll talk about adolescents and children, then, you know, they're not in a place to say no. So clearly a lot of children are, are threatened, you know, and told things like, if you say anything, I'll kill your family. And, you know, th this is basically getting back to that idea that if, if you see any sort of exertion or power or control um, being levied by the abuser, against the victim, then that's usually a clear case of CSA. And then the last thing they look at are the age differences between the perpetrator and the victim. So obviously there's an age advantage situation with perpetrators, right? So if someone is an adult with a child, they have a lot more control than they would if it was a child with another child, right? So limiting the power difference in some cases to only two years can still be considered um, you know, extreme enough for this to be considered CSA. So this is why this is confusing, especially when um, different groups are looking at how they define it often differently. This is why it's important to have clear, agreed upon definitions of CSA. But even in these cases, you have to really look at again, was there contact or not? Even if there wasn't contact, that might be CSA, right? What was the inter intention of the perpetrator? Did they try to use power? A coercion, right? Was there a large age difference? Those are things that are going to tip them off to, to clear signs of CSA. Um, when it comes to prevalence, um, just like a lot of things, um, as far as disclosure variability, so, you know, Child Protective Services, um, they assume, or what they say in the book, is that they're assuming that there's a lot higher reports of sexual abuse than are actually um, officially reported, right, because of the kind of stigma and shame and also the vulnerability of the victim and the idea that young children are going to have a very hard time seeking out authorities and also um, being able to articulate the issues that affected them, right, to kind of explain what's happening to them, right? So 
you know, um, when they look at the prevalence, they're looking at, you know, how accurate the, the records that are compiled by CPS are, because basically, even if, you know, child protective services are involved in some of these issues, that doesn't mean a child is automatically going to open up and um, disclose that these things are happening, right? So often child's uh, memories can be compromised or repressed, right? Um, sometimes, again, children just have a hard time articulating or understanding what they experienced in order to report that to an adult, right? Um, also, unlike child physical abuse, doctors are, are less aware of the issues of sexual abuse in their patients unless the patients are volunteering this information. So there are less mandated reports for physicians uh, because oftentimes, unless they do certain kinds of examinations, they're not going to know that abuse had taken place unless a child discloses it. And again, that's, that's an issue. Um, also, there's memory issues um, when it comes to disclosure. So, um, you know, in, in uh, some of the research in the book, they talk about how, you know, when you look at children in general, their memory accuracy can be somewhat suggestible. So often if children are exposed to leading questions, they might alter their responses or create fake memories to gain the approval of the adult asking those questions. So meaning you could show a kid a picture and you say, did you see a boat? Did you see a bear? And they'll say yes, even though they did not see that, even though those weren't pictures in the pack, because you're leading them to answer a question and children are socialized to be obedient to adults, so oftentimes they will say what an adult wants um, to please them, right? That's something that we're conditioned to do as children. So in these situations, it's very important the way that children are questioned um, in order to not give them false memories or, or um, you know, uh, basically lead them to saying certain things, right? And so again, memory accuracy, that's when they're looking at it in a lab setting. Imagine in the real world, right? Obviously, if a child is experiencing a traumatic event, that has all sorts of debilitating effects on their memory, right? Um, and one contention that people have is that victims just make these claims up, right? And there is research that shows that, you know, when it comes to children lying, um, them lying about sexual abuse is very rare, right? Not to mention the fact that if you have met a child under the age of seven or eight years old, they have a hard time lying at all, right? Like kids are kind of notorious for this, where they will say like, oh, I didn't eat all the cookies, even though they have like cookie all over their face and hands, right? Like it's the idea that children could be making up something like this is very unlikely, right? Because uh, first of all, just to be exposed to these kind of ideations is one thing, but also they don't really lie. And if they do, as kids, it's pretty clear what they do, right? So this is an issue. Um, there's also these debates that have gone on about recovered memory. So, you know, when, a, when someone has a memory that's recovered after a session where they were hypnotized to uncover repressed memories, you know, those are those questions. Well, how was this method done? were very leading questions, right? So there was a large movement in decades past that assumed you have to unlock these hidden doors of memories through hypnosis, right? But more, the, you know, the majority of research that has actually looked at this systematically has found that this method has very little validity and it can often cause people to adopt false memories. So that's another issue too, because we know that some people have repressed memories or have issues where they don't, they, um, the brain kind of blocks things from us remembering to protect us, right? To protect us from the trauma of it. But the idea though, that you could just kind of open that up with a hypnosis session is something that's a lot more um, controversial nowadays. Because again, the research really hasn't um, been able to prove that works, right? But they have been able to show that a lot of people end up with false memories. And in research settings where they're not necessarily just looking specifically at CSA, but just the idea of uncovering um, repressed memories. When it comes to estimates, um, the official estimates in 2008, that's the, quote, that's the most recent one they had in your book, right, identified 758,289 maltreated children. Um, and of course, when it came to the NIS-4, they were looking at basically 1.2 million 
cases. So there are a lot of official cases, but um, again, when it comes to how many are actually seen versus how many um, are happening, um, you know, a lot of researchers believe that this is much higher prevalence than what we actually see in reported figures. When it comes to characteristics of victims, um, the age of CSA victims basically varies from infancy to 18 years old. But most cases of CSA are typically taking place around 12 to 14 years of age. When it comes to gender, of CSA victims, um, females are more likely to be victims than males, though males are often, are, I mean, are also victims. Um, when it comes to race of CSA victims, there's no significant difference of racial or ethnic group. It's pretty spread across uh, all racial groups. But um, when it comes to socioeconomic status, uh, children in lower so SES are more vulnerable to um, CSA, again, because without having that kind of family structure or people to look out for you, um, maybe your parents are off working multiple jobs or things of that nature, um, or you don't have like a structured maybe after school or things of that nature, then you're just more likely to, um, you know, kind of face those dangerous situations. Um, and really, there's this awful issue of um, the potential within the characteristics of victims for self-blame right? Um, I'm sure you've often heard the term and the book talks about this, the idea that, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit in a minute, but the idea that abusers often look for people that are in more vulnerable positions to abuse, right? And it's kind of this idea that they groom them, right? They're looking for someone that's going to, um, you know, often blame themselves for these situations and not report them or they threaten them or things of that nature. We'll get to that in a minute. All right, so when it comes to um, characteristics of perpetrators, um, single parents are overrepresented in cases of CSA, with the highest incidence of abuse happening in homes where a single parent lives with a cohabitating partner. So, you know, someone basically, someone living with a married, um, basically, if you have a, a single parent with a cohabitating partner, it is 10 times more likely to happen in that situation than in a situation where a child is living with their married biological parents. So that's pretty significant, 10 times as much. Um, when it comes to age of perpetrators, um, the age is often between 30 to 40 years of age, um, but a significant number of perpetrators are also under the age or of 18 themselves. So that kind of... Uh, skews the the uh, averages in a way. Um, also, when it comes to gender of the perpetrators, um, perpetrators are, you know, as far as those that are reported and um, such, 93% of cases, um, perpetrators are male. And in about 7% of cases, perpetrators are female. Um, and when it comes to these female child sexual abuse perpetrators, these may be more common than the data suggests because the estimates are based on underreporting, right? And again, when it comes to race, um, these are basically spread pretty evenly across um, all racial or ethnic groups. Um, and then when it comes to dynamics and consequences, um, severity is one of the first things that they're going to look at as far as the specific issue of CSA. So they're going to look at the initiation of the abuse, right? So studies on perpetrators look at the techniques that perpetrators use to identify and recruit child victims. Usually, they pick children that are vulnerable or at risk, right? Some using force or threats to keep children from reporting these crimes. So again, grooming is the premeditated behavior intended to manipulate a potential victim into complying with sexual abuse. So they use coercive tactics of rewards such as you know, candy or money or toys, and they'll often use a coercive tactic of punishment, such as threats of violence, right, to manipulate children into abuse. And this is a new phenomenon that this has now become an online issue, um, where online um, molesters or, or perpetrators will basically use similar tactics by grooming children, by pretending to befriend them, finding out who their networks are. In some cases, they'll actually put a virus on their computer um, and take control of their camera on their computer, or they will ask for sexualized pictures, which they will later use as blackmail 
in some cases, they'll just Photoshop a benign photo, like a profile photo, and try and use that photo as blackmail against children, right? So in the same kind of way, you see um, the dynamics of the abuser as, you know, targeting specific children, typically. When it comes to child pornography, this is defined as a visual depiction of any kind, including a drawing, a cartoon, a sculpture, a painting, photograph, film, video, or computer-generated image involving sexually explicit conduct of a minor. So child pornography negatively impacts children by creating a market for victimization of children. And it serves as a tool that perpetrators use to blackmail victims. So this also has a kind of a link to um, prostitution as well, because surveys conducted with adult female prostitutes found that significant numbers of these women began working as prostitutes while they were still children, 60% of which started before the age of 16. So runaways can be especially vulnerable to these issues because they have no way to support themselves and no social system necessarily to rely on. A lot of people are in that system as runaways because they're trying to escape some of these forms of abuse at home. So when it comes to the effects of CSA, um, the initial effects tend to be um, somewhat counterintuitive, right? Or at least this is kind of one of those things that can bring upon, upon some of those uh, victim-blaming ideologies of the past, right? So one of the initial effects is mimicking sexual behavior. So it's one of the most common symptoms identified in victims is a sexualized behavior. So overt sexual acting out towards adults or other children, compulsive masturbation, excessive sexual curiosity, sexual promiscuity. So basically, one of the effects is that Children are being sexualized through these acts, and so they themselves are trying to understand or really identify with what this is. So oftentimes, this can be understood as kind of a, a grasping at control, basically. When you have lost control through these predatory behaviors, um, oftentimes the mimicking is just a result of a kind of confusion about what is normative sexuality and also uh, an attempt to reclaim that control, right? And then, of course, the other most common symptom of the initial effects is PTSD, um, which you know has its own list of kind of consequences and side effects that can affect, you know, everywhere from your emotionality to your cognition. When it comes to long-term effects, um, obviously the emotional effects can vary depending on you know your specific experiences of CSA. So, you know, there's often a lot of anger that a lot of victims face, um, or just even depression. Um, or, you know, if this is someone that's a, a authority figure or a trusted authority figure, which this is often the case, then it can, can it give kids a loss of confidence in like pretty much authority or a loss of belief in a lot of things that they cared about before. So let's say, um, I know this is something that was controversial within, uh, the Catholic church, right? Um, so imagine how that could be a loss of faith issue for someone that went through something like that or, um, you know, if this is like the the um, Sandusky kind of situation where it's a coach or a trusted figure like that, how much that can affect your relationship with all sorts of things in your life. So, you know, there are often very long-term emotional issues that are um, difficult to deal with that stem over, you know, long-term. And of course, interpersonal issues of just trying to trust people, right? Um, and oftentimes people end up becoming re-victimized if they have not, in, in their adulthood, if they have not been able to kind of understand or interpret or deal with some of these things. Um, also, victims often exhibit promiscuity, but some actually have a lot of phobias that get attached to sexuality. So they'll feel like a lot of guilt, or they won't have sex, or they'll have a phobia or general issues around having sex. Um, and as far as uh, long-term effects, there's also behavioral issues that are common, such as eating disorders or substance abuse. The eating disorders are very common in relation to CSA, and part of that is because when we look at eating disorders, we think of them as a specifically bodily issue, but it's, it's kind of true, but it's not. See, a lot of it has to do with control, right? Like if someone has gone through a situation where they've been vulnerable and they've lost control, this can give them the opportunity to control something, right? They control what they put in their body. 
So it kind of becomes a way for, I mean, obviously a very bad way of, that has a lot of negative health outcomes. But when you look at it psychologically, this is how a lot of people cope with the situation to kind of control their own body's system, right? But of course, um, there are so many negative consequences that come with that. And of course, substance abuse is a similar situation of oftentimes people are self-medicating to deal with the kind of negative emotional long-term effects or those other interpersonal problems, um, you know, with alcohol or drugs in order to kind of soothe them, right? Um, when it comes to factors that increase trauma, um, obviously duration has a lot to do with this. Um, the longer and the earlier the onset is going to matter. Um, also poly victimization. So if you were experiencing CSA, um, where you are also experiencing neglect, where you're also witnessing IPV, right? We know that there's a lot of co-occurrence with other issues that happen. And so often, um, if people have experienced some form of CSA, they might have experienced some of those other forms of abuse or neglect. Um, of course, the severity, right, of abuse is also going to be factored into how much trauma someone's going to experience. Um, whether or not the abuse was committed by a parental figure or a trusted acquaintance, um, whether or not the abuse involved invasive forms of sexual activity, and of course, whether or not there were negative reactions by significant others to the disclosure of abuse. So this is one of those things that's just heartbreaking where oftentimes when young children will confess this, depending on the family structure, depending on the situations, sometimes they're not believed, right? And this is, seems like the most horrendous outcome possible for someone to suffer this and then not be believed, right? So um, that is something that obviously would cause a negative reaction um, and probably in likelihood cause that person to not disclose this to other people when they have opportunities later on because they fear that they're not going to be believed, right? And that causes all sorts of distrust or problems or, um, you know, resentments that can form from those kind of issues. So when it comes to explaining CSA, there are certain risk factors associated with child sexual abuse. So, you know, similar to some of the other forms of abuse, you have anger, um, poly victimization, re victimization, PTSD, sexual adjustment issues, like we talked about being either having issues of promiscuity or having issues of, of a lot of phobias or guilt around sexuality, um, or just those dysfunctional behaviors we just discussed, like eating disorders, substance abuse, um, you know, alcoholism, or even having fear of medical exams. Um, because of the invasive nature of them, right? And so when, you know, um, the book is trying to explain these factors of CSA, first they look at um, focusing on the victim, which is how early research explained CSA. They would look at the victim's culpability for encouraging or allowing sexual abuse to occur, which is insane, <laughs> right? It's insane. It is insane to blame a child for something like this. But anyway, that is what a lot of early research explanations did. They would, you know, research has since found that children do not ask for abuse. They cannot be at fault because they are clearly not at the age of consent, meaning that they are not mentally capable of consenting. So those horrible, you know, theories were not so great, right? Um, because a lot of them were looking specifically at... Um, as if a ch child was culpable, which is ridiculous. Um, and then the other research started looking at focusing on the offender. Um, so again, early research typically looked at a psychiatric model, assuming that cases of abuse stemmed from, you know, the specific psychopathy of that individual of, you know, mostly, like statistically mostly male abusers. But later attempts focused on how there's additionally deviant patterns of sexual arousal and childhood history of sexual abuse are often linked to um, issues of offenders, right? So a lot of these offenders have had, you know, these situations happen to them and they are like playing them out again. So, um, you know, some theorists argue that there's a relationship between the offenders and some sort of deviant sexual arousal or pedophilia. So, um, you know, some argue that perpetrators are seeking out sexual encounters with children because they're sexually attracted to children. And so the origins of this deviant sexual arousal are very undetermined. So some argue that it's a, 
neurobiological factor could be the cause of pedophilia, such as low levels of white matter in the brain, <laughs> right? We're always like, it's some part of the brain, right? While other learning theorists argue that it's a behavior that develops when it's reinforced through fantasies of sexual activity, such as seeing childhood uh, or child pornography and masturbating to those kind of fantasies can then um, kind of reinforce that kind of sexualized understanding within people that have those tendencies, right? So there's, there's a lot of arguments depending on if you're looking at it from a more um, biological point of view or a more learning theory based point of view. Um, but there is a, um, a procedure that they tend to do, um, or at least in the past when they were looking at offenders that they would use to try to determine whether or not someone was sexually aroused by children, which was um, a, a device that they would basically attach to someone's penis to measure whether or not they were aroused by certain images. Um, and when it comes to, again, newer research, they tend to see the relationships between having a childhood history of sexual abuse and being an adult sex offender. So they've, they've found that some of these experiences of adult sex offenders are differing from those of non-sexual offenders or rapists. So when it comes to adolescent sex offenders, they found that those that are charged with CSA versus non-sexual crimes are more likely to have experienced it themselves right? They were often more likely to be introduced to pornography at a very young age or start masturbating at a young age. And 38% of adolescent sex offenders had had some sort of sexual activities with animals. So clearly deviant to our cultural understandings of this, right? So there's this thing called the sexually abused, uh, sexual abuser hypothesis, which is just argues that if you experienced or observed victimization, that an offender can learn that children could be used for sexual gratification or as a form of anxiety reduction, and that kind of solidifies that ideation. So then looking at um, trying to focus on the family as a way of understanding this research, some um, perspectives of those family dysfunction models um, or you know, some arguments that there's CSA is really just an outcome of the family dynamics which often that just means blaming the mom, <laughs> right? So a uh, mother's behavior was basically what early theories were based on. Early theories would say that it must be the mother's not having uh, defined clear sexual relationships with um, the husband, and that would drive him to find satisfaction elsewhere, right? That kind of biological imperative notion that we have of men's sexuality, um, that women don't have a sexuality, but men do. And it has to be, you know, they have to sow their seed or whatever it is. And so really these early theories just blamed mothers like, well, if, if you had satisfied your husband, these issues wouldn't be happening. But again, of course, that's completely ludicrous. Um, but then, you know, in, in the contemporary view, there's still some um, argument about what the mother's role is in these situations, um, since it's per overwhelmingly men committing this. And like we said earlier, overwhelmingly in a single parent household where she has a cohabitating partner that is not the biological father, right? So um, oftentimes a mother's role can contribute to a child's vulnerability, meaning rather than holding the person responsible for the abuse. Um, often though, mothers are co-victims, not co-conspirators, right? They are also facing abuse and that's why they're not speaking up is because they are also under control and being terrorized. So when it comes to um, looking at those general characteristics of the family, other theorists argue that there's significant levels of dysfunction in families that have issues of CSA, um, such as conflicts in marital relationships or parent-child relationship conflicts, kind of like what we see in the film Capturing the Freedmen's, right? And then other research really looks at um, focusing on society and culture, which often the culture encourages the sexualization of children. Cle clearly, the media, um, mass media portrayals of sexuality and children create an environment that encourages a defense of this behavior, right? Um, it's, it's really sad that, you know, uh, younger and younger children are being sexualized in our media systems. Um, and so some integrative theories are looking at, um, you know, basically according to the integrative theory, early developmental environment of a sex offender includes several stressful elements such as poor attachment between parents and children, 
low self-esteem, limited coping abilities, and a history of sexual abuse themselves. And that kind of is a perfect storm for um, kind of leading to factors that are more likely to cause, you know, um, people to abuse. And then when it comes to practice policy and prevention, um, victims and offenders are diverse in their pre-abuse history. So it's kind of hard to just have one cookie cutter treatment program, right? So the nature of their abuse experiences, um, the varying social supports that they have, their coping resources available to them, those are all going to be specific to the family. So treatment programs have to tailor their services to the particular needs of each individual client, which obviously makes it more complicated. So um, there are some counter-transference issues also, meaning it's very important how therapists react towards victims, their perpetrators, and their families um, in order to basically offer in a supportive environment for um, you know, victims to be able to heal. Like, obviously, in the historical account of having much more victim-blaming ideology that would often um, think that victims were somewhat to blame for their own abuse, that's not the kind of therape therapeutic environment where someone can actually heal, right, clearly. So how therapists treat victims is very important. And really, even if they're working with perpetrators, it's important as well um, to be able to teach them or help them understand that what they were doing is wrong, right? So um, this can be complicated, though, because in the treatment process, um, like we talked about with CSA victims, they often can be very sexualized or have very sexualized behaviors. And that obviously is going to make an adult that's trying to deal with someone going through a sexual uh, trauma uncomfortable, right? If you're trying to deal with it, you know, with uh, give someone therapy and they're, you know, being overtly sexual with you, that could be very uncomfortable. So that that is an issue that um, a lot of people working with families and, and victims have to deal with. Um, also, there's a lot of people who work in these agencies that might have experienced CSA themselves, right? And while they're hearing these victims recount their experiences, this can trigger their own memories and experiences of abuse. So it kind of recalls their own victimization. So therapist susceptibility to vicarious traumatization is very important, meaning hearing these stories affects how people see the world and their outlook, right? Like, for example, I have a friend that I grew up with that her dad was a sheriff in L.A., and he saw some stuff, like some really bad stuff. So his perception of what normal life was, I guess, like suburban Orange County was, <laughs> was very different from, um, you know, the experiences he saw on the streets where he was patrolling. And he was very restrictive about what his daughter could do, who she could go out with, what, you know, where she could go, because of his perception that basically around every corner is lurking someone trying to, you know, steal your daughter or something of that nature. So obviously, how you see the world is going to be affected by your interactions with people. So if you are a situation like this and, and you're being a therapist or you're working with clients and you're not kind of having your own treatment or having your own mental well health or mental being, um, you know, cleared, then oftentimes you're going to be vicarious to vicarious or you're going to be susceptible to vicarious traumatization. So hearing their trauma, their experiences could cause nightmares could give you um, anxiety or panic issues, um, PTSD-like symptoms, and it can't be overstated. Like This is an important thing for people to know that want to go into practitioner um, roles because they need to be prepared to know what to do, to have their own therapy resources, to have their own social networks, to have their own connections so that they can deal with these issues that come about just from um, hearing the trauma situations that happen for victims. Also, um, when it comes to therapy for survivors, there's different kinds of therapy based on your experience. So um, obviously it's tailored in a lot of ways to the specific needs of the person. When it comes to treatment for offenders, the goal is to alleviate any significant symptoms presented by the individual or the adult. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different types of treatment that kind of fall under that banner. So the types of treatment would be, um, first, there's medical approaches. Like in some cases, people have been castrated. Um, in some cases, people have had brain surgeries, like lobotomy-like situations. Um, drug treatments. Uh, nowadays, it's more, more common to have a form of chemical castration that lowers someone's sex drive, right? Um, but of course, there's a lot of therapy 
such as um, insight therapies, where they try and work with offenders to help them see their role in the abuse. Because as we'll talk about, a lot of abusers don't understand either A, what they're doing is wrong, or B, they have ways to externalize or blame other people or the victims themselves for what's going on. So inside therapies help them understand that they are at fault, that what they did was wrong, so that they can then actually learn and work from there. So there are some also family system approaches where, you know, they'll try and offer family unification in therapy that involves the non-offending family members, meaning that if someone has experienced CSA, they're probably having a lot of issues with the parent that didn't abuse them um, as well as the parent that did abuse them. Meaning if their mother was in the home and didn't intervene, even though she knew that this sexual abuse was taking place, then there's going to be a lot of pain and resentment and betrayal that's going on within that relationship. So clearly there needs to be some sort of family-based therapy to help bring those people together. Because again, remember, um, the mothers or the, you know, 90%, 97% of time are the mothers or, or women in these situations, um, that could themselves be, you know, co-occurring IPV or they could be being sexually abused. Like we don't know, right? In a lot of these cases, there are co-occurrence or situations like that. So we can't necessarily jump in and assume that mothers were complicit or let abuse happen and did nothing, Because in a lot of cases, they were also being victimized, right? So that also helps them to be able to have that kind of therapeutic resources together to kind of understand each other's perspective, to bridge that gap, right? And then when it comes to um, dealing with offenders for like cognitive behavioral techniques, um, there are such techniques like aversion therapy, right? Which are a little bit more controversial nowadays, um, but were common for a period of time. And a lot of them are really focused now on relapse prevention, right? Basically giving people techniques to relearn what is appropriate behaviors so that they can make sure that this person does not commit such an act again, right? When it comes to um, policies for these issues, um, there are obviously education programs or prevention, I mean. There are obviously education programs for children um, that are really a good way, um, especially they were developed during the 80s, right? These school empowerment programs that were there to help children avoid and report incidents of abuse. They become much more popular, right? And this is a good thing because it basically reaches a lot of kids at once while they're at school, away from these family structures. But when it comes to research on this, um, research has shown that kids exposed to programs have more knowledge But there's no conclusive research that programs reduce incidents of victimization. So critics of programs say that it puts emphasis on the child's role, not the abuser, right? Just in the same way that we'll talk about later on with uh, a lot of issues of sexual abuse, people will basically say, well, how can women avoid being raped instead of trying to prevent men from raping, right? It's the same kind of thing. Teaching kids like, don't get in a car with a stranger, right, or things like that, that's important, sure, but it's still putting the blame on the kid to protect themselves instead of having more of a system focused on making sure, making clear in the culture that predation of children is wrong and will never be accepted, right? So obviously um, there needs to be a parental role within child education programs because programs have to be expanded to include parents and other adult caretakers who need to be educated how to safeguard their children as well. 